Hello, my name is Sven Eric Spieschiger. I'm the Entomology Program Manager for the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, and I'm going to present an update on spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania. On September 22, 2014, the Entomology Program of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture received a report from a Game Commission educator in uh, Eastern Berks County. The report detailed damage to Tree of Heaven, or Lanthus altissima, on private property and that it was being caused by an unknown insect. Upon visiting the scene, we were very quickly able to find several specimens of an unknown insect, uh, which we later found out was to be called spotted lanternfly. You can see a large cluster of these insects on the first uh, picture. In the second panel, you can see uh, an adult on the ground with its wings spread, uh, revealing its red hind wings. And you can see some of the damage caused to the trees in the form of sooty mold, which is formed on honeydew, which is ejected by the adults. I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling you uh, just a little bit about the pest, and it's sort of important because it, it helps to understand what the control measures are, and a little bit about the program that we have in place with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. First of all, spotted lanternfly it also goes by the name Lycorma delicatula. It is a plant hopper in the family Fulgoridae. In the whole world, there's about 129 genera, including seven, close to 700 species. In North America, there are only nine genera and 17 species, and most of these are in the southwestern part of the country. The genus Lycorma is represented by only seven species in the whole world, and we're lucky enough to just have one of them here in Pennsylvania. Like most plant hoppers, Lycorma pierce the stems or the trunks of plants that they intend to feed on with their proboscis and drink phloem from inside. Spotted lanternfly is native to Asia and has been found in China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam, and was introduced into Japan, South Korea, and unfortunately, most recently in Pennsylvania. When it was discovered in South Korea in 2006, it quickly spread and it was considered to be an invasive pest which impacted grapes and peaches. Fortunately, in Pennsylvania, we have not seen impact to peaches at this time. In Pennsylvania, spotted lanternfly is only known from five counties in southeastern Pennsylvania, including Berks, Chester, Montgomery, Lehigh and Bucks. And you can see we've actually surveyed quite a few other places in the state and determined it not to be present in these areas. You'll notice a lot of negative points up in Erie County, and Erie County is home to uh, quite a bit of grape production in the state. This particular slide uh, shows two years of banding efforts, and banding is when Tree bands which capture spotted lanternfly are placed, and crews or volunteers count the number of insects trapped on there. And what this slide shows through August of this year is that populations had remained relatively low um, throughout the uh, entirety of the quarantined area. Uh, we'll be updating this map towards the end of the season, and we expect some, some pretty good changes to this going into next year. Impact. So whenever we get a new pest, we like to know what it might do. Uh, Kutztown University has uh, started to develop a list of host plants used in Pennsylvania and has started to do some other studies as well. We're very fortunate to have uh, an excellent entomologist, Dr. Greg Setliff, working out of Kutztown, and very early on he was able to put some research uh, into play. Uh, some of what he has found uh, basically backs up what they found in Korea, that spotted lanternfly will make use of many different plant species throughout some point in their life. But throughout most of their life, they strongly prefer tree of heaven or Alanthus altissima. As the insects become adults, they will feed almost exclusively on tree of heaven until such time as they have finished mating and are ready to lay eggs. There is a list of host plants available on a website hosted by Penn State. The easiest way to access this is to Google Penn State Spotted Lanternfly and Hosts, and that will get you right to the page. The biggest impact that we were immediately concerned about due to the reports from Korea was potential damage to grape, orchard, hardwood, and nursery industries. 
Unfortunately, in Pennsylvania, populations have been detected in managed grapes. The damage comes when the adults feed on grapevines and eject a substance called honeydew. You can see a trail of clear honeydew in the first photograph. Occasionally, this will develop uh, a pathogen called sooty mold, and you can see that uh, pretty clearly in the second photo. This will cause the leaves to wilt and not be able to get sunlight, and if this gets onto the fruit, it will damage the fruit and make it unmarketable. Um, grape is, a, is an extremely uh, important industry in Pennsylvania. Most of our grape production is actually for juice grapes up in Erie County and towards the um, northern part of the state, but we have a vibrant wine industry going throughout the area, including in Berks County and some of the surrounding areas. Now I would like to talk a little bit about the life cycle. This pest has one generation per year, and that means um, basically you will get uh, um, eggs, immatures, and adults just one time throughout the year. So egg laying starts to happen usually around October. Uh, this year it started on September 19th, and eggs can be found uh, on trees and many other places throughout June. Around the second week of May, we start noticing the first immature instars hatching out. Uh, first instars are black with white spots, and many describe them as looking like ticks. They are active hoppers and they can crawl readily to uh, different types of plants. There are three larval instars. A larval instar happens when the insect needs to grow and shed its skin and become larger. On the fourth larval instar, it, as it emerges, it starts to develop patches of red. This happens around the first week of July and in through September. Adults start to appear in mid-July and will be around until the first couple of really hard freezes. Uh, the first season in 2014, we found adults as late as December 10th. Egg masses. So as they are eggs in overwintering, they have an average of 30 to 50 eggs, which are laid in lines, and you can see this pretty clearly on the first photograph on the slide. And these eggs are covered with a waxy substance. Uh, the one, this picture on the picture on the left has uh, had a female who was interrupted while covering her eggs with a waxy substance. As this waxy substance dries, it becomes cracked and uh, changes color a little bit and ends up basically resembling a splash of mud. Egg masses have been found on many different objects and are often well hidden. Uh, the first photograph shows several egg masses on a uh, barn plank. Uh, there's a rusty barrel with about 35 egg masses on the outside and another 35 on the inside. Uh, the middle photograph basically shows an egg mass laid on a grape post in a local vineyard. And uh, one of the reasons it's difficult to control eggs is uh, they are well hidden sometimes. The last photograph on this slide shows a standing dead birch tree where a panel of loose bark has been removed and underneath the loose bark is about 18 egg masses. Just some more objects that you may find them on. Uh, the first one is a four by four. The second one is a rusted metal U-post. You can see them lined up on the inside. And the last one is the bottom side of a rock which was piled up under some trees. And so controlling egg masses can be a very useful thing. You can scrape many of them, but you, you usually won't see all of them. Immatures are active crawlers, and every day they crawl up and down plants that they feed on. You can use this activity against them. Uh, as they crawl up, you can basically ban a preferred tree. Uh, we, our department has chosen to ban mostly Alanthus trees, and uh, you can actually catch many of them doing this. Uh, the bands pictured in this photograph hold about 3,000 specimens and 1,300 specimens, uh, respectively. Adults begin to appear in late summer and feed preferentially on Alanthus trees, mate and then lay eggs. Males and females mate multiple times. Adults and late instars are rarely caught on tree bands, but can be easily captured with other active techniques. Um, there are different types of tree bands available. Some of them are a little more effective than others, but uh, we are still testing out the various types that we have. So let's go through a year in the life of the spotted lanternfly. And for our purposes, we'll consider this a one-by-one-acre plot. 
and uh, we'll call the dark trees tree of heaven. So this is the preferred host tree. And we'll have all other trees represented by light green trees. We'll start at a random point in the year, like from October to May. You may find egg masses just about anywhere on a given property. So they're not necessarily massed on Olanthus trees. In fact, we found that they like to spread out a little after they have completed uh, their mating. And you can see that uh, if you can remove all of those, you can actually impact the population pretty good. But you're never going to find them all. They, uh, they are well hidden. Even our best people are only about 50% accurate when surveying for egg masses. So you may only see a small amount of what's actually there. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't scrape egg masses. It will definitely impact the population. As the immatures start to emerge, they will actually remain spread out on a property. Although they do seem to prefer Tree of Heaven, and we find many more on Tree of Heaven, you can find them on just about any tree that you put a tree band on. And we do know that they will make use of other plants throughout this portion of their life cycle. Banding Tree of Heaven will actually help to remove uh, quite a few of these from the population. And although it's not going to be the overall answer, it, it can certainly help you gain some sort of relief as you start to approach the late summer months. Uh, towards the middle of July, the late instars, so that is the instar that uh, displays red and the adults, start to really make a beeline for Tree of Heaven. And you can see that represented here. It seems like they really do need to take a meal from Tree of Heaven to complete their life cycle. In fact, many of the researchers we are working with are having trouble getting them to go through on colonies where they're using anything but Tree of Heaven. So uh, we can actually use this against them. After they've had that meal from Tree of Heaven and have made it, they do spread back out and seem to go all over a property. Um, Things that we find, and that's where you're at in October and November, things we find that they like are things like maple trees, willow trees, uh, aspens, poplars, just about any other species you can think of. Um, you can find them on Tree of Heaven this time of year, but it seems like the, this is how they spread out uh, to lay eggs to go into the next season. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, pro the eradication program, and this relies on a lot of cooperation. We have a lot of uh, local volunteers who ban their own trees, who also scrape egg masses, and we are also working with property owners, issuing them treatment orders to implement a, uh, a style of uh, IPM on their property, and IPM is integrated pest management. And this is a strategy that uses the biology of the insect against it uh, to uh, impact its populations the best way we can. So numbers through 2016, and these get updated uh, weekly on our website. But as of the time of this presentation, there were very close to 10,000 trees banded. And that has killed about 500,000 uh, lycorma. Egg mass scraping has actually killed way more than 650,000. That was updated by the time of the presentation. Uh, so we're, we're well over 1 million insects killed just from uh, the egg mass scraping and the tree banding. Public reporting for this has been extremely good. We have uh, received uh, at least 1,500 public reports at this time, and most of the ones that we have investigated have been accurate. It's a very high percentage with uh, similar pests, uh, the percentage of uh, accuracy from public reports was not so good. So this is uh, just a wonderful tool, and we have uh, we've really been uh, fortunate to have the public call in all of the positive sites that they have. Last part of our eradication program is really the meat of the program, and this involves limited host removal and establishment of trap trees. It's basically an attract and kill strategy. So from the tree banding and the egg mass scraping and the reports we receive in, we're able to select the priorities, the properties that have the highest capture. We also have done a few uh, low population properties on the outskirts to see how effective it is in a setting like that, and it seems to work well. Um, but there's a process involved. So each property is very different, and we need to meet with each property owner and issue a treatment order. 
the treatment order basically details uh, what action needs to be taken against spotted lanternfly on a given parcel of land. After the treatment order is signed or issued, we survey the Elanthus on a given property and determine whether or not there are wetlands. Uh, even if we have wetlands, we can still operate. We just have to treat the trees a little bit differently there. We have new tools that allow our crews to mark trees with greater accuracy, and these are coming online very soon. And we also need to revisit treated sites to assist with uh, the assessment of the work and also to help our contractors know what types of trees they have to remove and whether or not they're operating in a wetland. So the removal and trap tree method, most lanthus are removed or killed with herbicide. And uh, it's very important to note that we, we do our very best to remove most of the female trees because female trees produce seed, which can lead to more saplings coming up the next year. Unfortunately, a lanthus is an invasive tree itself. And when, when you cut down an Alanthus tree, you also have to deal with the root system. Because if you don't, hundreds if not thousands of new Alanthus trees will pop up from the roots that are in the ground. So uh, right now the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture does not recommend removal of Alanthus trees unless you accompany that with an herbicide. And this can be done most portions of the year, but not all year round. I mentioned that we remove most trees. Well, we leave a few up and we treat these with an insecticide. And though this method is designed to get the adults as they feed at the end of the summer, because this is the preferred tree for the immatures, you actually end up killing a lot of immatures all throughout the year. And you can see here on this slide that it was not uncommon on our treated properties to walk through and see many dead immatures on the ground. And so the way it works, is we leave the few trap trees standing, we treat those with insecticide, but it doesn't repel them, it actually attracts them in. So it, it basically concentrates for a very brief period in the year, the population of spotted lanternflies to the few trees that we believe they need to feed upon to complete their life cycle. They feed upon these and the insecticide ends up killing them. And so that's sort of what this looks like if we go back to our one by one uh, acre plot here. We basically remove most of the Alanthus trees. And in this instance, I've left them three trees, which we know they are gonna probably have to feed on sometime in late July or into August and September. Most of the spotted lanternflies on the property will mass on these. And since they are treated with a systemic insecticide, uh, they, they end up dying. And the, the results are actually quite dramatic. Uh, this is a shot of one of the properties that we treated in 2015, and you can see there are literally hundreds of thousands of dead bodies on the ground beneath the few trees that are left. And some more shots of uh, similar trap trees, and you can see that this, this actually is a very good way to put a little bit of insecticide out in the environment, but impact most of the spotted lanternflies that are there. If you repeat this over a number of seasons, this will collapse the population. And you can see here's a close up here. A lot of folks ask about uh, non-target impacts of the insecticide we're using. We are actually using a formulation of dinotefuran, which is a trunk spray. And it is a systemic insecticide. And what that means is the insecticide is contained within the tree and an for an insect to be impacted by this insecticide, they would literally have to feed on the tree. And since uh, this is an invasive tree in our area, there aren't a lot of other things that will actually feed on tree of heaven. And so as you can see from the pile of dead bodies, you're not really seeing uh, other non-target insects in there. Things that had concerned us were stinging insects like wasps, hornets, and bees. And you can see that there really aren't any laying in with all the dead bodies there. And so that is the program that the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture is implementing. Uh, our, our hope is to have several, as many properties as we can get done with the resources we have. And if you um, do this every year for a number of years, this will actually end up impacting the population. So this in combination with people doing egg mass scraping, people doing tree banding, and certainly if other tools come online, those will be added to the mix 
but all of this in combination will work very well to help get control of this insect. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Please visit our website. There are land management uh, tips at the top of it, and we post uh, new update maps whenever they're available at the website. Thank you.